So good morning to all. I'm very happy to be uh, with you today. Even this is through uh, this monitor because of, uh, of the pan this pandemic um, confinement. Um, so today <clears throat> we will develop the minimally invasive uh, implant surgery concept respect to uh, biology uh, and technology. Um, today, I'm broadcasting you this uh, webinar uh, from the French Riviera, where we have uh, our uh, International Institute of Laser Implantology, and this is where we are located, facing the Mediterranean Sea. So, uh, minimally invasive surgery, this famous uh, MIS, the definition of MIS that you will commonly uh, find uh, on internet, uh, shouldn't be uh, reduced to a uh, smaller incision. This is more than this. Uh, this is a full concept and not including only the technique, but also um, the procedures and, uh, um, and, and the material that uh, we are using. So minimally invasive surgery has a lot of advantages, uh, like in uh, um, in um, uh, gynecology, um, in uh, uh, cardiology, um, and it, it's a void, uh, an open surgery that is invasive. Um, it gives the same results or even better than the traditional uh, surgery. Um, give less pain to the patient, and lead to uh, less morbidity of the tissue. And of course, which is fundamental, uh, gives a quicker and faster recovery. And of course, the aesthetic is better. But we found um, this MIS in numerous of specialties uh, uh, in medicine, like radiology, but as well vascular and many other uh, specialties of medicine. In implantology, uh, the main problem is uh, represented by the lack of bone. And if we want to um, avoid um, these, uh, or treat, sorry, treat this uh, resorption uh, on heart tissue, uh, we have these augmentation techniques represented by grafting, uh, guided bone regeneration or distraction. On the soft tissue, uh, it's represented by the management of these soft tissues or uh, again by augmentation techniques and mainly uh, by uh, increasing the width of the keratinized uh, mucosa. But all these techniques are invasive um, lead to morbidity to the tissue are time consuming and none of all are predictable. Sorry. So less hard and soft tissue collapse, less recession. So if we want to uh, avoid uh, these, um, these uh, grafting uh, procedures, these augmentation techniques, um, then we have to prevent uh, this loss of tissues and mainly this loss of bone. And we need actually to optimize um, this uh, bone volume first. How? By preservation and regeneration, both bone and soft tissue, in managing them. And these are the main principles of this uh, MIS, minimally invasive surgery. During the, or since the, the Branemark era, uh, modern implantology, implantology has shown uh, to treat the simple cases. And we have globally um, um, 
96% of grid results, even it drops lately uh, to 90% uh, of outcome due to uh, the long um, uh, implant uh, overall uh, treatment. So um, since um, the very uh, uh, early implantology, we have well-defined procedure um, that uh, has been uh, detailed and how to show and how to show uh, to how to place an implant. We have learned as well how to manage uh, difficult cases. Uh, but these 3D reconstruction are unpredictable and non-stable. So the, the challenge or the question is, can we do something before this second loss of soft tissue? Well, in other words, are bone augmentation necessary or are bone grafts a must? Usually this so-called advanced or complicated surgery or nice surgery. But the, the, the questions are coming at, are these surgery predictable? Um, is this fully rewardable for you as the surgeon or the prostodontist after or for the, the patient himself? Do we have other options? What about the cost, the time, and the pain for the patient? So remember, whenever possible, avoid bone grafting. It's less invasive. However, it's not always possible not to augment. In implantology, primary stability is the critical parameter aspect. And depending on three other important factors. First, the bone by uh, the quality, the quantity, sorry, the quantity, uh, meaning the volume of the bone and the quality mainly the density of the bone, but also by the implant itself, by the shape of the implant, by um, the surface, um, the type of, uh, um, or the quality of uh, the threads and the implant uh, connection to the prostate. And the third aspect is how we place the implant. What is the procedure? to place the implant. And all these three aspects are interconnected together. Sorry, did a mistake. We all know Hippocrates for one main reason, is that we need to swear uh, on the uh, hypocrisy of has doctors. He's well known as well through this uh, vis medicatrix naturae, which is a compendium of the principle uh, of Hippocrates that uh, sum up the, uh, uh, the different process uh, shown by Hippocrates in the healing power of nature, showing that uh, the body contains in it himself um, this power to uh, heal. Actually, uh, Hippocrates was the first minimally invasive doctor, invented. Um, this uh, Hippocratic bench or um, bed that was used uh, to put intention 
the bones and to reduce the fracture and treat this uh, fracture and putting um, and setting the bone together and putting them in traction. This bed is still in use um, in these modern uh, uh, times and known as a traction table in orthopedic. Is um, well known as well by these uh, Hippocratic bandages that are placed on the fracture uh, bone and uh, to contain the two pieces of the bone and uh, confine um, this uh, fracture. Um, is, it was uh, actually the, the inventor of this uh, rectum speculum that is uh, uh, the first maybe uh, record um, example of um, a medical device like this uh, as um, in uh, endoscopy. So used as well as a minimally invasive device to avoid any uh, cut of the body. So what are the four main principle of minimally invasive surgery? First of all, of course, the flapless. And let me explain this through uh, biology and the nature of, um, of the bone itself. So in the cut of a long bone like this, uh, we have the cortical bone known as the dense bone, um, which can be bent till a certain point known as the Greenwood fracture. Um, this dense bone, uh, very uh, strong and resistant, is very delicate as well uh, due to its uh, vascularization. And we have this cancellous bone, cancellous bone or sponges bone. This can be uh, expanded or compressed due to his, uh, tra its uh, trabeculus, meaning that we can mold this bone. And over this one, over the um, cortical bone, we have the periosteum. This periosteum that you see on this cut of bone shows that we have two different layers of the bone the outer layer, thick and dense, give the strength uh, to the periosteum. And the inner layer, which is thinner, and actually uh, um, confer um, to, like in this uh, uh, picture, um, the uh, red aspect of this periosteum, um, on the skull. Why? Because um, the periosteum is actually having 75% of the vascularization of the bone. And the 25 remaining is just coming from the endosteum. So under the microscope, we see how are two different layers of the periosteum, the outer layer or fibrous layer, uh, with fibroblasts and um, some blood vessels. And the inner layer, uh, which is uh, uh, represented uh, with a lot of uh, pre-osteoblast uh, undifferentiated cells. Um, and this inner layer is fixed to the cortical that you can see uh, under uh, the dense bone by fibers actually uh, sharper fibers and uh, some collagen fibers as well, and uh, uh, some vessels going through uh, the cortical. These two layers of uh, the periosteum that you can see on this picture um, is represented again by these fibrous layers. 
uh, fibrous layer containing the fibroblasts and this cambium layer, cambium from uh, cambium uh, Latin main change. So this cambium layer that you can see under the fluorescency uh, microscope um, was a lot of uh, uh, concentrated pre-osteoblasts. And these will migrate to inside uh, towards the, the cortical and bringing the new bone. Uh, what is the main use of these uh, two layers of the periosteum? Well, again, you have uh, on the left side, uh, our periosteum during a fracture, uh, the other fibrous periosteum that makes like a bandage and we hold the two pieces fronting to themselves face to face. Uh, and uh, acting like uh, a bandage that will confine this hematoma um, and the inner layer uh, that will help to bring the new um, bone cells. And during this process where we have a neovascularization, uh, this is the uh, picture B, um, through the woven bone and this woven bone will uh, migrate to uh, um, or evolate to uh, cartilage bone and then this cartilage will calcify and the, uh, this carti uh, calcified cartilage uh, will uh, end up by uh, modified, uh, modified bone and remodeled, totally remodeled bone. If we uh, go back to our um, alveolar bone, uh, we have here um, the endosteum and uh, from uh, the alveolar bone and the periosteum. So since we know that we have 75% uh, of the blood supply held by the periosteum, actually uh, through this uh, outer layer, um, so we don't want in raising a flap um, to prive the uh, blood supply of 75% uh, towards uh, the bone. So uh, this will maybe explain a lot of uh, uh, this uh, resorption of the bone. So we've seen that this healing process of the bone is going uh, from the formation of the hematoma, going through the neovascularization and modifying the bone and have to uh, uh, a bone consolidation uh, known as uh, bone remodeling. And this is uh, extensively uh, published on, uh, uh, in orthopedic uh, journals, like here in the surgery of the hand. So this uh, bone resorption uh, will deeply affect um, the, uh, the, the, let's say, uh, the implant that you will place uh, in a socket. And you have here uh, with this tape one, tape two, um, tape two, uh, sorry, A, B, C, um, the evolution of the buccal aspect uh, of the alveolar. So uh, remember, um, during an extraction of the tooth, uh, you better think twice just before extracting the tooth and in placing the question, shall I make a flat or not? Uh, how will I respond my bone, my alveolar bone to this extraction if I raise a flat? Um, this is why actually we set 
uh, different procedures uh, respect to uh, the tissues um, affected to uh, um, the anatomy of the patient. So um, sometimes in an immediate post-extractional implant, uh, we usually uh, uh, go for a different axis, more parallelly, uh, that will allow to leave more uh, bone on the alveolar aspect and especially on the buccal aspect uh, to place the implant. Like in this case, we have the uh, parallel orientation and then uh, uh, we place the implant, even we leave a buccal gap uh, from two to four millimeters. That will be uh, or not uh, graft by uh, any material. Or another technique, which is known as the soccer uh, shield technique in leaving uh, the buccal aspect of um, the root and avoiding some uh, resorption of the buccal aspect. In this slide, uh, we have the, the placement of an implant in two uh, different cases. Um, in a healing healed site. Um, and uh, we see the, the, the case one, which is the, representing the, which is uh, the, the traditional um, surgical case, I mean, flapping and then uh, using a, um, a different uh, files, different uh, uh, aspect with the, um, expanders as well. And um, on this uh, case, probably like this shows, uh, we will have um, down on the right, uh, maybe a um, healing problem in replacing the flap. That means that uh, probably we will have a bone resorption due to uh, the lack of bone supply of the buccal aspect. And probably this case one will end up by uh, bone resorption buccal. On the case two, uh, we have the placement of the implant in uh, uh, utilizing uh, bone expanders uh, like um, the case one. But the main difference here is that we're not flapping. That means that we need totally um, the um, the periosteum uh, stick to uh, our cortical and giving the, the option uh, to this periosteum to recreate the new uh, What do you think after a flap like this on the canine, upper canine, uh, what will happen to uh, this buccal uh, bone aspect? Of course, we will end up by a full vertical and horizontal uh, resorption. So uh, maybe uh, in many cases, you can treat this case flapless. Nevertheless, um, we have to think about what's under our flap. If we go flapless, uh, we need to know that what kind of bone I have under and how thick is my buccal aspect. So probably on the, on the right, a picture, we will have a resorption of the buccal aspect. So how can we avoid tissue collapse? Of course, in preserving bone supply. So go flapless, but um, with the total knowledge of what's under your flap. Mini, mini uh, uh, implants or short implants are a very good solution in some case of uh, extreme resorption of the bone if we don't want to graft. So uh, it's uh, a very good option and actually an outstanding option to place implants in uh, resort uh, bone solution. Many and many uh, patients uh, are afraid of uh, going under 
um, grafting process. So again, uh, short implants is a very good uh, solution. On this clinical case, uh, we have on the, the site 16, uh, resorption of the, uh, of the bone. Um, and uh, we want to uh, avoid any uh, uh, external uh, sinus lift, I mean, a tatum uh, open uh, surgery of the sinus laterally. So uh, we think that we can place an implant uh, in the summers technique and uh, or internal uh, sinus lift in placing an implant, maybe larger with a larger diameter. And in this case, uh, with a uh, height millimeter eye. So uh, our resorption uh, of uh, our bone under the sinus of native bone is 2.5 millimeter. And uh, uh, we will place this, this is the treatment, treatment plan. And uh, we think to place the implant um, in uh, minimally invasive uh, procedure, that mean without any uh, raising any flap and uh, uh, utilizing this uh, summer technique. So um, this is how we place our implant uh, using uh, osteotomes. Uh, you can see uh, on the top of the implant um, a different gray uh, um, uh, um, color. Uh, which represent um, the impaction of the um, collagen and PRF membranes mixed with the gratid bone uh, uh, during the elevation um, of the sinus. So this is the, the day of the surgery when we did the, um, the sinus lift, placing the implant, and we placed at the same time a larger uh, healing abutment to uh, cope with the tissue, to uh, uh, having a, a, a slight a compression of our uh, hour soft tissue. Of course, um, the implant is placed in compression of the bone, in bone expansion. Um, this is the CBCD um, during the, um, during the, uh, or just past, uh, past up. Uh, and we see on the, on the 3D reconstruction that we have on the top of the implant, a more densified um, uh, uh, representation. That means that we have here higher collagen membranes and PRF membranes mixed with this grafted uh, bone uh, elevated uh, uh, during the elevation of, uh, of the sinus. Um, the, cor the corona um, slide here in the middle uh, shows uh, um, that we have uh, our both uh, cortical and that we place uh, uh, the implant in a good condition. So um, this is the past up by two months. And we see that uh, we have a new formation of the bone uh, up to the, um, the apex of the implant. Um, of course, um, this bone needs to uh, densify uh, with the time, but we have a good, uh, uh, a good uh, uh, resolution of, uh, of the bone. Here is the clinical aspect with the healing abandonment uh, after two months and showing a good um, integration on the soft tissue as well. This is by three months past up and placing the, uh, the, um, uh, the final abutment and, uh, and the crown. Um, actually here, a zirconium ceramic uh, screw retained crown. And you see that uh, uh, we have a nice definition of the bone uh, all around the implant, uh, uh, including the, the apex of the implant. Um, a second case here, uh, with the number uh, 46 um, periodontally or endoperiodontally compromised. And we need to extract these tooth because we have a, a too big infection on the apex of the three uh, uh, roots of these tooth. So we decided in the same way, minimally invasive uh, placement of the implant uh, immediately uh, uh, post-extractional. Um, during the, 
the surgery, um, keeping the access uh, and densifying the bone. Placement of the implant with a custom uh, healing abutment uh, that need to flare uh, the soft tissue actually around and avoiding any invagination of, um, of uh, any, uh, um, any uh, batteries. And uh, after three months, we switched to uh, um, uh, a less uh, wider healing abutment to leave um, the, the potential of the bone to grow uh, over the, the implant uh, color. And by five months, with the placement of the final, um, uh, the final restoration, and um, this is a, a zirconium uh, ceramic crown, and we see that uh, distally, uh, where we have the shadows of the shadow, sorry, of uh, um, the, 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 the distal uh, root, that uh, these um, need to uh, mature, and uh, uh, but we have a good uh, uh, densification of how bone. So the second uh, main principle is the, decontam the decontamination on both soft and hard tissue. And this is fundamental. And uh, let me show you this uh, uh, quick video and showing the placement of two implants, uh, minimally invasive in the nail side. Um, uh, we uh, uh, ablate the soft tissue and we go through a summer technique uh, using here um, uh, the osteodome manually and manically and uh, uh, placing some collagen membrane, densifying the collagen membrane, pushing the membranes um, and fracturing the last millimeter uh, of bone remaining, remaining under the sinus, controlling, probing all the time the four walls of bone as well as the progression of the fracture on the apex. Like here, we feel um, the, the sinus membrane, we clean it up with uh, uh, chlorhexidine, putting uh, uh, now membranes, a collagen membrane and PRF membranes and pushing up in the fracture uh, and keeping them um, uh, on the top and pushing all these membranes with the insertion of the implant uh, with a high torque, actually, uh, in this case, uh, like 80, because uh, we have to uh, use the manual uh, torque, and have to write 80 uh, Newton centimeter, and placing another uh, distal implant in the same way. Uh, we place this implant uh, under the bone level, um, under, uh, under the other um, crest, so subcrystal. Uh, uh, here we're placing the healing abutment and we need to have a slight, uh, a light compression of the soft tissue to uh, uh, ensure um, amethicity and avoiding any uh, contamination uh, of, uh, of uh, our uh, implant site. Uh, in the same way, uh, using here manual uh, osteotomes and uh, um, mechanical osteotomes, uh, again, uh, uh, pushing up the fracture I with uh, collagen membranes. Pushing, the fracturing the last millimeter. Here you see um, uh, the bleaching of the soft tissue uh, shows that uh, we compress uh, the bone at this step, so fracturing the last millimeter here. Uh, and we want to densify not only um, in fracturing the vertical, but we want to densify our bone uh, per uh, implant. So this is why we use uh, in this uh, in this example um, the expanders mechanical expanders and pushing again up to completing the, uh, the placement of uh, the membranes and finishing by the placement of the implant um, under the bone level again. So 
so it's controlling it forward. Um, this is the, uh, the control X-ray with the two inputs and uh, the placement of the final uh, restoration. And here, um, the view of uh, the clinical view of the final restoration. But this patient, um, a lady of uh, around 60 uh, years old, uh, showed up after one year uh, after the, the placement of the implant. And uh, she was complaining for uh, pain and a fistula. You can see here um, the, the clinical view um, with the fistula. And actually, uh, when we did uh, the OPT, uh, the um, Panorex, uh, then we see in placing a, a gutta perca file inside um, the fistula and going through the track of the fistula and showing uh, uh, the epical uh, infection uh, at the apex of, uh, uh, of this uh, first pre -mode. So we decided in the same way <clears throat> to uh, go under a minimally invasive implant placement. Um, flat place, of course, you see here um, the clinical aspect and showing the, the fistula. So but after the minimal invasive extraction of the tooth, uh, flat place, then uh, we saw in placing a uh, uh, Lucas Guret that uh, we had uh, um, a bone penetration showed here by in uh, placing a, a curette and on the second elbow of the curette, uh, we can see that we have this uh, fenestration. So um, we made the full decontamination of the socket, of course, uh, and uh, what we call degranulation. And this is what this uh, slide shows that uh, we have in cleaning um, the, the socket with, the, with the, um, the, the, the laser here, an erbium laser. And we can see that we have some granulation tissue coming out of the socket. So uh, we finished um, the total um, debridement of the socket. First, very light manually with the uh, with the Lucas Curet and then handing up by uh, the uh, ablation uh, of uh, the bandable uh, superficially. Uh, actually, this bandable is known uh, uh, as in Latin as the lamina dura. And lamina dura is supposed to hold um, the sharp fibers and the collagen fibers that are mainly uh, doing uh, or making the, sorry, making the, uh, the, the periodontal ligament. So this periodontal ligament is supposed to be uh, uh, or infected or at least contaminated. So uh, we won't get rid of this and in uh, making the full ablation uh, of the surface of this socket. Um, then you see uh, here the granulation tissue. Uh, we see that uh, these lasers uh, and we see here um, the laser energy going through the diffusion of, uh, of this laser energy through the tissues. And here as well, you, we can see uh, through diffusion of uh, the laser energy, uh, the fistula. Using um, a, another laser here, uh, 810 nanometer, um, to clean up um, decontaminated, fully decontaminated uh, socket and going in this case through the fistula up to uh, the epical lesion and handing up by um, the dehydration um, of the superficial layer of the carotenized tissue. You see here um, uh, the bone uh, level and the uh, uh, socket that is uh, totally uh, uh, clean with the laser. Then uh, we um, apply um, the osteoderms uh, because we want to expand the bone, uh, peri um bone. Uh, and we have to respect, of course, um, all the access of um, the implantation of the implant. Um, here, um, the picture showing the placement of the implant. Of course, parallelly, uh, we see that uh, we placed it under the bone level. Um, we probe and uh, we measure 
uh, around 2.5 millimeter uh, of a gap between uh, the buccal aspect of the bone that was remain and, and the placement of the implant buccally. Um, so we don't fill up uh, with the graph this uh, gap. We leave the gap like this, just maybe in placing a collagen membrane since we know that uh, uh, in right, uh, remodeling in the first stage uh, of uh, uh, healing, the bone will need some collagen. So we place uh, either collagen membranes or a PRF membranes to fill up this gap. So, uh, but the main step, which is uh, uh, the most critical here is how to close within the soft tissue. And this is uh, in the same surgery, how we close the soft tissue in building up uh, a provisional crown. Uh, this is the immediate uh, OPT uh, X-ray uh, of the case and showing the implant and the placement of uh, um, the provisional crown uh, with different uh, colors because uh, we use uh, both uh, resin and composite uh, to be and uh, to smooth um, the, the internal aspect of uh, the provisional crown. Um, this is by um, one month after the placement, after the surgery, uh, 30 days. And we see at this stage that uh, we had uh, um, a good um, healing uh, of both uh, hard tissue, like on this uh, control X-ray uh, and, and uh, soft tissue. And then we uh, end up by um, placing a uh, zirconium ceramic uh, crown uh, 2.5 months uh, post. -op. This is by 2.5 months, and we still have some uh, during the placement of uh, the final restoration. And we see we still have some uh, inflammation of the soft tissue. And then by two years uh, here on the control of the patient after two years, we can see that uh, uh, the, the, the soft tissues have filled out um, the um, uh, proximal spaces. Um, so we have a, a good resolution of this case. Even we have some, uh, um, some uh, loss of soft tissue uh, on, on the color of uh, this uh, premolar. So the control X-ray by 4.5 years, almost five years, uh, was a stable, uh, very stable uh, position of the bone. And ending up by um, this uh, uh, last week's by the placement of, uh, with the same uh, procedure, the placement of uh, an implant in number uh, 34 with an immediate uh, crown immediate loading. So the third um, aspect, the third principle uh, aspect of this uh, procedure is what we call the BVO, uh, bone volume optimization. And this is very important because uh, this, this is what will allow not to use it in a biomaterial. So in this case, uh, we have um, an OPLES uh, number uh, 45, 44 actually, and we uh, plan to uh, we plan to uh, make the extraction, uh, a full decontamination, placement of the implant, and placement of the uh, immediate uh, uh, or provisional provisional immediate restoration on it. So this is the treatment plan. So we know that uh, we have uh, about uh, 10 millimeters of uh, bone defect. Um, of the crown and we make, uh, of course, in all the cases, uh, we make a cone beam uh, before just to know that and to show that we have in this case um, how four, four uh, cortical bones uh, that are mandatory uh, to the placement of an immediate uh, minimally invasive uh, placement of the implant. 
So this is the treatment plan of the CBCT in showing the, the plan of placement of the implant. Uh, we know that uh, we're close to uh, uh, the mantle nerve, mandible nerve, sorry. And this is uh, uh, immediate uh, post-op or intra-op uh, control uh, with the placement of the implant. Uh, minimal invasive uh, flapless placement of the provisional abutment and the provisional crown over it. This is by two months. And this is by two months when two months when we retrieved the provisional crown. And this was the provisional crown. Uh, done extemporarily uh, on the chair on the day of the, the surgery and then we retrieved the provisional crown and we placed the final restoration ceramic full ceramic uh, zirconium ceramic and this is by three months after the surgery with a very good uh, um, peri-implant uh, bone condition Another uh, very similar case, uh, limited uh, or very uh, borderline case, uh, we have here a number of 45 um, periodontally compromised tooth that are showing uh, even uh, piston or vertical uh, movement. So um, this is uh, the placement of the implant. Um, we had a very big uh, resorption. We clean it out, uh, no um, flap, uh, no use of uh, biomaterial. And uh, we have a very uh, high torque here. Uh, torque was about uh, 85 to 90 uh, Newton centimeter. And we can see the, the, the shadow of the lesion on the color aspect of the implant. And we place a larger uh, healing abandon. Um, this uh, was a few years ago. Now we have a larger uh, healing abandon that allow to close much better um, the, the, the soft tissue. Uh, this is the follow-up by six months and showing with a, a full ceramic uh, crown uh, with the final uh, abandon over it. Uh, we see uh, the beginning of the calcification of the other bone. And uh, we have uh, uh, a total healing by two months after the surgery and showing a very good aspect of our uh, crestal bone. And this is by four years, very uh, uh, stable um, bone, alveolar bone. And this is by five years. And uh, we ended by uh, this uh, last week in placing an implant uh, with the, in the same condition on uh, um, the upper jaw with uh, sinus lift action. Um, this is the clinical, uh, clinical aspects uh, of this case. Uh, the pre-op on the upper left and showing that uh, we have in this case uh, 16 uh, millimeters of uh, bone defect. You can see the, the extracted uh, tooth with uh, um, tartar with uh, calcification all around the implant. And the, this tooth was old only uh, with uh, one millimeter inside the bone, uh, but still moving. Um, the placement of the implant, uh, more uh, lingual, and we have a gap around. Uh, you can see uh, uh, all the granulation tissue that uh, uh, we extract from uh, the lesion, uh, flapless, of course, and uh, we see uh, on the lower middle um, view, clinical view, that in this case, because uh, we had just a six millimeter um, uh, healing abandonment that we needed to uh, make two uh, um, stitches, two uh, suture, uh, proximal, uh, to uh, cope with the soft tissue to uh, the, uh, the uh, healing abutment and uh, ending the surgery uh, by the placement of uh, uh, periodontal pack. Um, the clinical aspect after six months follow up, 
with, in this case, a very thin uh, 1, 1.5 actually uh, millimeter of uh, keratinized uh, tissue. But uh, actually the, the patient didn't want any uh, further surgery or soft tissue surgery uh, to, uh, uh, but, uh, but the case was uh, very stable in, uh, within the time. So another case here was number 15 and uh, was um, uh, cyst, actually with a um, oral antral uh, communication, uh, communication to the tissue. Uh, so um, we decided in the same way to make the extraction and making an immediate uh, post extraction implant. And this is the treatment plan. Um, this is um, the CBCT showing that uh, uh, we have uh, a cyst on the apex of number 15, and uh, we have this communication uh, from um, the lesion to uh, the sinus. So in this way, uh, we wanted to uh, go flapless, uh, making the extraction, the full decontamination of uh, the socket, like we saw before, and uh, placing the implant, of course, uh, placing some collagen and TRF membranes, and the grated uh, alveolar bone that uh, uh, we retrieve in utilizing these uh, osteotomes. So in pushing up and in the fracture, last millimeter um, uh, uh, bone um, from uh, the bottom of uh, the sinus. And this is um, the pulse stop. And another very challenging case uh, was uh, uh, a patient showing uh, uh, a wide resorption of the pre-maxilla alveolar bone. Uh, so we decided same way uh, to place uh, the implant all on six uh, in a minimally invasive um, uh, way. I mean, extraction fully decontaminated the, the socket um, and place uh, this uh, six implant. So this is what we did. Uh, the last two implants distally are tilted, of course, um, and uh, are um, with uh, internal sinus lift in the same way that we've seen the, uh, the formal cases and placing the final restoration. Um, this is the view of, uh, of the case uh, of a six months past up and placing the um, final restoration here, um, uh, ceramo, uh, ceramic metallic uh, restoration, uh, fully in ceramic uh, with the, um, the external view, uh, the occlusal view and uh, both lateral view, uh, allowing in this case uh, to keep all um, both uh, the hard tissue and the soft tissue. So uh, we can um, do exactly the same procedure uh, within the lower arch here uh, with a all on six uh, placement, uh, extraction and placement at the same time of six implant uh, to uh, place um, immediate loading uh, provision of uh, bridge. So the fourth um, main principle uh, is the guided bone regeneration. And this, uh, um, this is a case uh, where we have uh, here an OPLES uh, number uh, 24, uh, 25, sorry, uh, which is fracture. So we see the, the fracture of the, of the tooth. Uh, actually, we had a, um, a twin uh, crown uh, together with the 26. So we make the separation of the, of the crown. We extracted um, the tooth, minimally invasive. Um, you have a, a, a small animation on the right showing the different process, different steps uh, of, the, of the procedure. Here, after the extraction, so we clean all and we fully decontaminated um, the socket. You can see uh, just uh, 
on the edge of the soft tissue, some granulation tissue that are pop out of the, of the socket in, uh, in making the cleaning, actually in this case in using a, an ABM laser and finishing by uh, fully decontaminated with, uh, uh, with the um, uh, infrared uh, laser here, a diode laser of uh, 810 nanometer. And making the dehydration um, de of uh, the current in ice tissue to avoid any invagination and uh, a possible contamination of uh, uh, the implant site. The placement of, um, of the implant uh, with a, uh, expansion, condensation, and with a slight um, sinus uh, lift, internal sinus lift. Um, in this case, uh, no case, we place um, uh, uh, diameter six um, healing abandonment. And so in this case, we need to uh, put just two uh, um, suture uh, measurely and distally just to cope with the soft tissue. But uh, in the, the last case that we have, uh, we have a, a wider uh, healing abandonment that allow not to make any uh, suture at all. So this is the, um, the occlusal view and showing after uh, three months uh, the soft tissue and uh, uh, the implant uh, on placed under the bone level. So the healing, um, this is by four months. And this is when we retrieve the uh, healing about man. And this is how we get uh, fully uh, um, uh, the alveolar bone and uh, filling up um, the gaps. Here, in, when we place the final abutment and the final um, metallic uh, ceramic crown, and this is the final view uh, with the final restoration, showing that uh, we almost um, lost no um, bone, and because we have this bump uh, aspect uh, of the buckle, um, buckley. And this is before and after. So within the time, we know that uh, these papillas will fill up uh, the proximal spaces. So uh, what are these uh, four principles of the GBR, of the guided bone regeneration, this famous pass? So we have, we need a primary uh, closure of the wound um, to promote this uh, and distribute our uh, and uh, interrupted uh, healing um, of the surgery, then uh, angiogenesis to provide necessary uh, blood supply um, and, and differentiated uh, mesenchymal cells, uh, then the creation of the space and the maintenance of this space uh, to facilitate uh, ingrowth bone. And then the uh, stability of, of this wound uh, to reduce uh, blonde clot formation and allow uh, an eventual healing complication. So GBR, GBR, uh, and I show here with this small illustration um, how uh, we proceed. We proceed. Uh, so a full decontamination after extraction, uh, degradation of the uh, degradation what we call uh, decortication, which is not uh, uh, fully exact because uh, we don't have any cortical in this, uh, in the second, but we have the, what we call the lamina dura, which is uh, known as uh, a bundle bone. And we know that uh, this bundle bone cost uh, the sharpest fiber and the collagen fibers uh, that highly, um, uh, have a high potential of contamination. So we want to ablate the superficially um, this uh, uh, ligament. So decontamination, full decontamination of the socket, placement of the implant with uh, expansion and placing uh, the healing abutment that uh, need to cope 
um, the, the soft tissue. So in the case that uh, um, we have a wider socket, both um, with the hard tissue and the soft tissue. So uh, at the top uh, or the coronal, um, the third coronal, then uh, if we not comply totally the closure with the soft tissue, then we will apply uh, two uh, fracture of this alveolar bone to allow with a sort of a roof movement with the fracture of the alveolar bone to cope with the healing abandonment. And this is what is represented by uh, this animation. So if we need to make this fracture, these fractures need to be done with the osteotomes and with a partial thickness flap. We don't want to raise the flap here with the periosteum, since we have seen that the periosteum is fundamental uh, and uh, more maybe fundamental in flapless uh, um, uh, uh, procedure. So again, to preserve this crestal bone after the extraction, then uh, we provide a full um, debridement of the socket. Uh, then this famous uh, decortication, um, then decontamination of the socket, placing the implant and um, trying to have a, an expansion of this, uh, of this bone. And if we're not coping with the sealing of the soft tissue with in utilizing the uh, uh, healing abutment, then the fracture of this crystal bone and then placing um, the uh, healing abutment that need to cope and to give the hermeticity of the soft tissue uh, to this healing abutment or, uh, or provisional uh, abutment. So in the case that uh, we are um, uh, doing under this uh, procedure, I usually use um, either um, micro bistury um, like in this case on, on, the, uh, on the left, or um, what we call Lucas correct, that are, uh, have a cutting shape. And that allow you to uh, go with a partial thickness there. So remember, we want to keep this, uh, this um, partial thickness flap and we want to keep the periosteum uh, stick to uh, the cortical bound. And we need to make this uh, uh, back and, and forth movement uh, to have a, um, or to comply with this uh, partial sickness flap, like in this uh, in these slides, uh, showing the back and forth and forth movement. Then uh, it will allow uh, in giving more elasticity uh, to this to this uh, partial sickness flap. And in the case that we need uh, this elasticity to close uh, to, uh, like in this case, to close uh, the soft tissue to uh, the healing abutment. In this case, uh, we are respecting the, uh, the principle of uh, the GBR technique in creating this space and uh, closing the space and not allowing uh, the cross contamination uh, with uh, the socket, with the implant sides. So uh, um, another uh, borderline case, uh, we had here a patient showing a, um, a, a, a full uh, reconstruction bridge, a complete bridge um, on the lower arch. Uh, this bridge was moving totally and just held by uh, granulation tissue. Uh, on an infection that was uh, uh, going from uh, 42 to uh, 44. 
So we decided uh, uh, to make the extraction, making the full degranulation, um, uh, the debridement uh, of the infection, placing two implants um, on the same session. Um, and uh, we placed the implant and uh, uh, the right implant uh, very deep, but leaving a bone defect of five millimeters on the major aspect and the distal is 0.5. Uh, on the implant on the left side, we had 1.5 uh, bone defect. Not using any biomaterial and just um, closing the defect uh, with PRF membranes and collagen membrane and suturing over, um, over the implant. So, and this is by the past of by five months with the placement of two locators uh, uh, over the implant. So you see that we have a complete uh, healing of the bone and the soft tissue as well. So this is the follow-up by four years. And this is the close-up of, uh, of the same case and showing the three uh, roots with um, the granulation tissue that was totally moving. So we clean it up, we place the implant uh, with uh, uh, bone expansion. And uh, we just place this uh, collagen and PRF membrane uh, just over the implant. So this is by seven months and we created a new bone um, just in, in with this uh, principle, uh, GBR principle in keeping this safe, uh, unperturbated, and closing this, uh, and avoiding any uh, uh, cross-contamination. Another case here, I'm showing uh, uh, an old place uh, number uh, 36 that we need to extract because of two, uh, two infection to cyst on the apical uh, of this tooth. So, uh, extraction, decontamination, same process, uh, we place the implant. Um, at that time, we didn't have the larger uh, healing abutment, but we placed the implant the day of the surgery or the extraction. And this is the, the past of by four months. And we uh, begin to see uh, the, um, the closure, especially uh, the closure of uh, um, the socket of the distal aspect of the distal uh, root. But at the same time, we see that uh, majorly uh, we have recreated a new bone. The past of about four, uh, two years, sorry. And this is um, um, the follow up uh, from the pre op uh, till uh, uh, two years after past up. So uh, the pre op. Then the day of the surgery, when we place uh, the implant, you see the shadow of the distal uh, root, but at the same time, uh, we have a, a bone uh, resorption or a bone loss, let's say, not, not bone resorption, because this is a shadow of, of the uh, mesial uh, roots. Um, but we have the shadow and, and uh, bone is missing. So after, um, after six months, we have the closure and the calcification of these two uh, defect, bone defect, um, without, I remember you, without using any biomaterial in this case, uh, just collagen and PRF membranes. Um, and then um, at um, three years past up. So we were able, in this case, to recreate bone. So this is the clinical aspect picture. And uh, this is by seven years, seven years after the placement of the implant. And we were able to recreate uh, bone distally uh, and uh, measurably over, over the, uh, the implant. Another case uh, in a hill site, we had here a bone resorption, um, both uh, horizontal and uh, on the <clears throat> number 14, uh, 24, sorry, um, and uh, a vertical resorption uh, because of the, the sinus. 
So placement of the implant, no flap, um, minimally invasive, invasive, placement of three implant, uh, two uh, with sinus lift and one with uh, bone expansion, uh, peri uh, radial. So the day of the surgery, and then um, the day of the surgery on the upper left and uh, um, on the middle upper, uh, we see uh, uh, the past up picture after two months. And we see that uh, we have uh, two months past up, a thicker um, um, soft tissue uh, and uh, even um, uh, higher. So the day uh, of the impression, after retrieving this uh, healing abandonment and showing the um, four, the three uh, implant placed under the bone level and uh, um, the impression and the placement of the final restoration. So what is uh, uh, very important in this case is that uh, we have very good um, uh, soft tissue condition. And we know that because of the pampered aspect of the buckle, uh, we have uh, uh, kept the, um, the bone, uh, the alveolar bone. So um, the X-ray of this case, uh, pre-op, um, the past up by three months, and we uh, began to see uh, uh, the new bone formation over the two internal sinus lifts on the two uh, last implant, distal implant. And then uh, we placed the, uh, the measure one, uh, number 24, with uh, a radial expansion. Um, the follow up by five months. So again, the pre op was the treatment plan. Um, the uh, intra op during the, uh, the surgery with the placement of uh, this three implant. Um, the past up by three months. And uh, by five months with the final restoration. And uh, we did um, CBCD by five months passed up. And this is the CBCD that is showing that uh, we have on all three implants on the apex of this one, uh, we have new bone formation, uh, which showed up with um, uh, gray um, uh, color and uh, not so white because it's not completely uh, calcified. So we see on this uh, picture that we have uh, same sinus, no infection. And we see that uh, we have our three implants we are all, with all the cortical, um, the palatal and the buccal uh, cortical. And we can see uh, as well some um, bone uh, fracture on the top of uh, some implants. So again, on the magnification of the CBCT, we see that uh, we have a, a new bone uh, formation of about uh, four or five millimeters on the top of all three implants. Another case here with a big um, bone uh, resorption on number uh, 24 and the, bo the bone and fracture uh, on uh, uh, the number uh, 27. So we decided to make the extraction in the same way, cleaning, debriding, decontaminated the bone. Um, we didn't graft um, the, mesial, um, the mesial socket because we had a, a total resorption of the, the two uh, cortical aspect, the buccal and the palatal aspect of the bone. So we decided to place three implants uh, with internal sinus lift. And this is uh, the follow-up of this case with uh, the, the data of the different uh, OPT of this case. And you see that during the time uh, we had this typical um, uh, shape of the bone, uh, what we call the tent uh, central uh, pole uh, aspect. And uh, in this case, I remember you that uh, we didn't uh, graft any bone here, just uh, using astatum and uh, re pushing up um, the last fracture and uh, uh, the sinus membrane. So with uh, this last picture, 
I would like to thank you very much for listening this webinar and uh, uh, merci encore de votre attention. Thank you.